Hello, and welcome back to New Terra Noxta. I'm still Noxta, and this land is still new. A um, hmm. little bit of progress, not a whole lot of the visible sort. I've got a bit of a chicken pen there, I've been collecting some chickens. Food source is a bit more stable than it has been for a while. I've got a whole bunch of steak, I've been farming some cows over on the waterhole I did it. And so we've managed to survive on a diet of mostly pumpkin pie and and a bit of steak. Actually there's a fair bit of steak now, but for a while it was just the pumpkin pies. For a while we had plenty of pumpkins, but we were getting very few eggs and I started collecting those chickens and then I got loads of eggs and not enough pumpkins, so <laughs> that's how things have shifted. Oh, another thing, which we've got an outhouse now. Fill the paper, use your toilet, use a little cesspit, there's a big pit down there. It's empty. Normally when I build cesspits, I kind of build them up a bit for decoration because I don't know. But this time I decided, well let's start with an empty and then maybe fill it up over time if I can be bothered. So, <laughs> there you go. Um, not lots of change here. I've got Butch chilling out near the door. I haven't brought the guys over from the ship yet, and I want to do that, but the big problem is really zombies. Um, you'll, you'll notice I've actually taken off the extra door I had the two, and it looked very cool, but it's a bit awkward. Villagers have trouble getting through it, so I've decided I'm going to stop that. The main problem is zombies, they break doors, even sometimes when they're sitting around not breaking the door, they can still hit the villagers through the door. There's a, there's a lot of problems that make zombies difficult to work with, and without, you know, torching the whole place and making it look ugly. Or, you know, doing some rebound here to where the zombies can't actually get there. And also making it look ugly. And potentially also creating problems with the villagers. I've decided the best way to deal with the problem is probably with some command block magic. So I'm going to make a little totemy type device that I'll stick somewhere near the door, possibly underground. And what that will do is thinking making it will turn all zombies not to be able to break doors because it's only a small percentage of zombies that have that ability normally and I'll just it'll just switch them all within a small radius maybe make give them a bit of weakness so they can't hurt for a while possibly teleport them away or something like that I haven't quite figured it out yet and I've got a few ideas for some other things I want to make but the way I want to do this stuff is I want to create a spell book which will have a spell which will allow me to assemble some things. So I've got a small enchanting area, I've made it look quite fancy. And I've finally, with all those cows and the reeds, I've decked it out with a full 15 books. And the way I'm going to do this is, to make this spell book, I'm going to just do a normal level 30 enchant on a book. And obviously I'm doing this all with command blocks, so I wouldn't have to do this. But I am going to do this to start with. Costs three lapis. What am I thinking? So, and then we're going to go into creative mode and set up some stuff that will make it actually all happen. So that that that's the main fun part of this episode. So this is going to be fire protection three. Well, but what we're actually going to do is destroy this somehow. We're going to run a command that I prepared earlier. And, uh, oop, we do need to put a slash. Oop, I need a command block. I forgot about that. It's too long. <laughs> okay, so we're going straight into creative mode. Giving us a command block. Why can I not place it there? Oh, you are standing in it. Pasting it into there. Now you've got to be careful when you go into creative mode, so actually this is what I'll do. I'm going to dump my entire inventory just into here temporarily, because this is where I left off. And I don't want to accidentally replace any of my items. So when I'm doing stuff in creative mode, this is what we do. So that'll just chill in there, I'll take off my armour also. Alright, now I can go nuts with whatever I want to do. Alright. So, uh, this gives me an assembly spell book. Uh, actually, the button does not go in there. Um, it looks like this. There's a squiggly bit I can click on. And at the moment, all it does is say a thing. 
So we're going to make that actually do something. But for now, I'm going to put that in there. And first we need to create a scoreboard objective. Scoreboard objectives add spell, we're going to call it. And it's called, it's a trigger. So that means now when I do this, it should tell me... Well, it doesn't recognize that I have that spell value or something, but that will... I need to enable it, essentially. So, we need to find out somewhere that I prepared earlier. Doesn't the world look lovely from up here? Let's just take a moment to enjoy the scenery. Alright, so we're going to go teleport ourselves down to minus two. And somewhere around here we should see, there we go. We're beneath the world at the moment. Here we go. And we're going to give us some night vision while we're working down here. Night vision for a thousand. Remember to turn it off when you go back into survival mode. I was like, last time I set this up, it was all like, I was like, alright, now let's do some caving. Wow, it's really bright in here. Wow. And I was like, oh, still got night vision. So, this clock, well, this is the clock. It's just falling sand, and redstone block that drops down here and gets summoned back up there, sets a bunch of blocks. These are all the commands that I used to have set up inside the main mast of the battalia. Now I've moved them down here so that they're a bit close to the land. Eventually I'll probably move the world spawn, but this is just the very edge of the spawn chunks here. So that means there'll be, it'll, it should be constantly running wherever I am in the world. These commands essentially, they just take any zombie skeleton or creep around the battalia that's not one that's set to not despawn, like the NPC or Mr. Bones is. The others aren't those mobs, but if I had a name tag on Takes any of them, sets a value, and makes them disappear with a poof. Alright, so what I need to do is I need to grab a command block, and I need to, first of all, ooh, there's a lot of things I need to do. <laughs> So, and I'll probably stick a lot of cuts in here in a sec, but I just want to set up the basics. We need to test for a player who's got a value of spell, and I also need to set up... I, th I think I'll just always enable the trigger. That's how I'll do it. So that's going to say... I don't want to be in positive Z direction, so... This direction looks good. What am I doing? What is it? Scoreboard? Players enable. Yes, yeah, scoreboard players enable. At A, we're just going to call it. And spell. That's the command we're going to use in here. And that means that if I was to use that book now, it would give me a message that said something about a thing set to 1. So. After that, and we'll leave another gap so we can see where it begins, we want to have one that is, we're testing for any player, so we should probably put at P with the score spell in of 1. So that means when this clock goes and I've set that spell, this will detect me. And this means it should be multiplayer friendly as well. If there are more than one person who's used it simultaneously, then it should detect them. Well, it'll just detect the first one that comes across, because that's what we need for now. And then what we want to do is when that happens, we want to set another bunch of things to happen all at once. So this is how we're going to do it. We're going to go fill, and we just check we're in the positive x, and we're going to go positive x, positive z, so posi positive z first, so same x, same y, and we'll move it about, uh, we want it far enough away that it's not going to interfere with any other commands we have, yeah, so 10 blocks should be enough, and we want to go there to how, pretty much however many spells we want to end up having, let's just go 10 for now, and we can add it as we need to, and 10, and fill that with redstone blocks. Alright, so now if we trigger spell set 
one, which is the same command that that book sets. Then I should get that, and we should see that this is functioned. And ooh, that also needs to set our spell back to zero, but we need to do it after checking all those things. So if we tunnel this way a bit, and eventually I'll, once I've figured out I've got enough space, I will set this to be surrounded in bedrock so I can't accidentally run into it if I'm mining when I'm doing survival stuff, because that would be weird. So somewhere around here we should come across a bunch of redstone blocks. Let's hollow out a bit of space around these. So I stuck up a command block here that when these turn to redstone they'll get switched back to coal. So you can see if I set trigger to 1, they'll flash to redstone for a sec. That means any command blocks touching these will be activated in order going from here to here. So, as we said, we also want to have the trigger set back to zero afterwards. But we might want it a bit of a delay in case we have any delay in between. So I'm just going to set a repeater up and say, scroll or ord play is set star, and that'll set anybody on the scoreboard spell to zero. Or we could also have it reset. And that would remove the data if we don't need it. Why not? Doesn't make much difference, but... So if I set it back to zero, we should now be able to go set it to one and it should flash. Then we should be able to set it to one and it should flash again. Alright, now we need to detect which spell we've cast, because the book we have sets it to one, but it'll have other spells that set it to different numbers. So, let's see, what do we want to do? We want to say, well, we want to be able to check if they have, the player has the desired XP to use that spell, and if they've used that spell, then preferably send a message if they don't have enough XP to use the spell. So, perhaps, Well, we can send a message to the player, we can... Right. Alright, made a few changes down here. Instead of just detecting for the spell and sending a pulse there, I've now set it to... This detects for the spell and then switches on this piston, and then this repeater sends the pulse to this block. The reason for that is I now want if there's... It, well, I want it to be if there's a player who's cast a spell, then every time this ticks, it'll send a pulse to that. Otherwise, for example, if two people... or... well, in short, if you did a spell twice in a row, that would mean that it wouldn't detect and then it would continue not detecting for eternity. And also, some of the changes I've made down here. So I've got it so when you cast a spell, it detects if your spell's one, it says there's a bunch of effects. I've got here, it sends a message and a sound if you don't have enough levels. And then it resets the value of the spell. So instead of doing it after here, I'm now doing it here. And here I'm setting it so if you do have enough levels, there's a bunch of effects. And then it sets this chain of stuff, which will do some detecting. And from this stuff, it's only going to be able to do one player at a time because it needs to use outputs from the command blocks and you can't do that for multiple players. So that's why I, the other reason I had to do that. And then after it does all this, I put that delay and then it resets the players that use that spell, which I should actually also set to make sure because I've got it resetting all of them. I want to only set it so it resets the nearest one and I should probably make it the nearest one to zero 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 otherwise that will cause problems and then in the future we'll make it only check play that matches those criteria that is nearest to zero 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 all right so now we need to actually do some things and that's still our positive x so what we're going to do is we're going to set up a bunch of dispensers because the way this spell works you stand on a dispenser and you rearrange some a crafting recipe type of thing in there to do a specific thing and you, you stand on top of it and use the spell 
So I'm going to set up a bunch of sample dispensers here to compare with. And that will determine what the spell actually does. So for one, this is an example. So we want to execute on at P, so only one player. These are the coordinates we're starting to check from, 0, 0, 0. Could use any ones, those are just the obvious ones. We want to score, spell, that's what min equals 1. Score, spell, equals 1. You know what they need? A max argument and have it score spell is always equal instead of the greater than equals because this is just annoying having to type it twice every single time. So on everyone that's used the spell, what do we want to do? Where they are, we want to test for blocks and we want to check, let's just check our command reference. Alright, so the way this works, we want to say what is it? And, one is that. and two, we set the checking. It doesn't really matter because we're only doing one block. But so where you're standing, compare that to this location here, which is seven nine two one. Seven nine four. All right. So we test for those blocks. That, that should actually do it. So are you standing on a block that's the same as that one? And if you are, we will get the signal into here. And we might want to actually set up something similar to what we did there, where it doesn't pulse just to make things even more annoying but otherwise yeah like if two people use the spell twice in a row <sighs> wow but now I should be able to if I set my spell to one um, I just get the basic stuff if I'm standing on top of the dispenser that matches this one guess what this one does I also get the extra effects and if I stand on a dispenser that doesn't match that one, say it has a lapis block in the middle. Oh, that's right, I made those get that effect. But I, that dot specifically does not flash, is the important thing. Because it still tries to craft a thing, but it doesn't find a recipe. Alright, and then we just have to set up what it actually does, and set up the loop. So I'll be right back. Well, that got complicated rather quickly. So... Uh, a few changes. What what did it look like before? I'm trying to remember. Um, the things that do the thingy effects I've moved. So now when this happens, this checks compares to the recipe. I've just got these here to test. And this will switch on or off when it switches on. It sets a bunch of blocks out here to harden to clay. When it switches off, it sets them to obsidian. And then after that, there's a delay in which it sets all the blocks in this field that are hardened clay, which should theoretically only be one row, and it sets those to the redstone, and then this sets them back to hardened clay so it only does a single pulse. And then after doing that, that's when it resets that spell value. So then all I have to do is stack up along here the command blocks I want to actually occur when you do the spell, probably involving whatever thing Spencer, you're standing on switching to not having the recipe in it. Alright, so I've added a thing and I figured the simple way for this particular recipe all we want to do is give it a specific item. In fact, probably most of these will be, so I don't actually need all this length. But there might be one where I want it to do longer fancy stuff, in which case I'll have to extend that. Otherwise, I couldn't actually shorten it. But I decided it was easiest to just clone in a dispenser with the item already created and clone it directly under you. So I made the recipe, that's the recipe we're going to use, and 
I'm going to trigger the spell. We'll see. And I've just been testing. I made it give you a slowness effect. I think here it is. When that happens, just so... Because before I did that, I was able to use the spell when you're here. Quickly move to the side, and it would place a different dispenser. And you keep the original ingredients. And so far, with this, I haven't managed to do that cheat. So it seems to affect that. The item is a zombie totem, which is a zombie skull. Oh, I need to actually change some things. This is the thing I used to give it to me. I don't need actually this line in the lore. But I've added a special tag to it, which means I can track it when it's placed on an armor stand, which is the important fact, which I'll then have to add some extra command blocks in here to do things when I do such. But I've made it now possible to create one of these. I just need to add one more thing. I need to add the part where it deducts the levels from you when you do the spell. Which I don't want to do while I'm testing it because I want to make sure I have the right number of levels when I get back to reality. Uh, and yeah, I've just set up sample recipe. There'll be a, I'm going to do a similar thing for a creeper totem, which will have a slightly different effect. Probably same recipe with gunpowder and a bunch of other recipes and things I want to do, which I'll set up in the future. But for starters, I want to get this one working. All right, I've prepared a bunch of other recipes here as well. I've added in the things that should deduct the levels. Um, there's some interesting recipes. So there's our zombie totem one, and there's some other fancy things which I'll let you guess as to their purpose. Um, so far I've only got the zombie totem one working and I've just set up the things. So basically what happens is we have a temporary scoreboard value which gets reset. Then this checks for an armor stand that has one of those zombie totems in the head slot. Well, yeah, in any slot really, but you can only put it in the head. And, oh, yeah, that's part of that one. <laughs> I was just like, what the heck's that? So prepared. Um, this makes a bunch of particles on said armor stand. And so does this, some different ones. This puts some particles on all zombies within a 10 block radius of said armor stand. This does an entity data effect on that zombie and it does a few things makes it so they can't pick up loot or break doors in case they could makes them bounce up in the air a bit as well this makes them make it sound just a bit of a quiet sound and this gives them a weakness effect for five seconds so that they can't hurt you and it's only within a 10 block radius of that totem so it's fairly short so I've got that all and I discovered there is actually a game rule where you can well, send command be be back to false. So that means if I type in a command, it won't actually tell me anything in the chat, which means when I do that spell, it won't pop up and say that thing anymore, which is good. But it's nice to have it off whilst doing some work. So with all that done, I think we're probably ready to go test it out. It's like none of that ever happened. Let's see if I can remember how this goes. I believe it's like that. And I think there's diamonds there and lapis there. Let's see. We stand on it. We go assemble. It cost us our 10 levels. And lo and behold, we have a zombie totem. Alright, I need to stick it somewhere here near the front door. I don't know if I want to bury it so I don't see it, but or I could put it there, maybe. Maybe give it a little platform pedestal thing. Let's just test it out for now. We'll worry about the fine details later. And if I put this on there, I can get rid of the scoreboard effect. <laughs> I don't need to test that anymore. Set display sidebar. We see these little particles and I guess I have to wait till some zombies show up to test out how effective it is. And I also need to test how effective it is with villagers. So for the purpose of that, I might spawn in a temporary villager just to do some tests and figure out if it works effectively or not. So this here, this is expendable. And I'm using him as just a test dummy. 
basically, what they want to figure out is, is he safe to stay in there by himself at night without my assistance? Which he should be, because this thing should stop any zombies from being able to get to him or hurt him. Unless he get, becomes an idiot and starts to panic and runs off. Which could potentially happen, but I think generally they only do that when the zombies get inside. Um, yeah, so that, that's the other thing, testing is this thing effective at preventing the zombies from coming, but also is his AI sufficient to keep himself alive when I'm within the area close enough that mobs can be spawning and active, but not close enough to bother doing anything. So, I guess we have to wait for some zombies to come. Come on, zombie. Taking a sweet time. Alright, so if I retreat inside and go and sit on the roof, perhaps. Uh, that zombie should gain interest in Expendable. Or possibly in Butch. So Butch is actually doing some, something useful for the moment. And ruining my test, actually. Oh. Well, he's standing at the door, and he can't knock on it. And it sounds like Expendable's still alive. Hey! I'm slightly concerned about him. Like, if the zombies ganged up on him a lot, they may have been able to cause actual harm to him. I can hear the noise of that totem doing its thing. I'm actually genu genuinely concerned about Butch. So far though, these guys are doing a lovely bouncy dance. So yes, it is effective at preventing their entry. I'll have to work on deciding whether it's a little bit overpowered. Well if you go and open the door, of course they're going to hurt you. So I was just saying, I do have to work on it because it's a little bit overpowered and whether I want to reduce the effectiveness of it, or make it cost more or something. Let's go look for Butch. He was down this way last we saw him. Oh, there he is. He's okay. He's safe there. Okay. So... It seems villager AI can't quite be reckoned with. So, I mean, they haven't killed him yet. It's a plus. Don't know what they're all doing, actually. Well, these ones are stuck inside now, but apart from that. So, I don't know whether it's safe to bring the guys across or not. Like he opened the door, what a knee. Unless I set up a redstone thing that would cause the door to become locked with a piston or something at night. But I, I, I want it to be a one-way thing so they can still get in. And I don't want to make the floor silly and ugly, either. So I'll play around with the idea. Decide what I want to do, how I want to solve the problem. Whether I should adjust that thing to make villagers not move. Although, that could have the problem of if they get stuck outside, they could be even worse. But whether I could have something to put in here that villagers go to and they won't leave while it's night, I don't know. Like maybe a villager totem or something. <laughs> With emeralds on a stick. Uh, I don't know how that would work. But in any case, I'll experiment. Decide what I do. I think I'm going to leave it here for this episode. I've probably got enough footage for all that stuff to throw in and make something vaguely interesting. Or possibly a short episode. But 
Let me feedback, let me know, like, when I do command stuff like that. Do you want me, me to do it like I did, like, show you step by step the sort of things I'm adding, or whether you just want me to do that all off camera and then just show you the results? And, like, is that interesting or is that just boring? Anyway, thanks for watching. Um, I'll figure out this problem a little bit, and then I'll see you next time. Bye! Oh, hi there, fish. Why are you talking to a log? What? By the way, it's raining. Wait. Raining? Water. 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 Fresh water. Beautiful fresh water. Where? Really?